Why do you think men's issues have been ignored for so long? Um, I think there are a number of reasons why men's issues have been ignored for a long time. And one of them is simply that men are conditioned not to complain as much, especially if it's about a gender issue, because we have an expected role to play. And it's kind of a chivalrous role. It's a role that takes on responsibility. And when we complain that we're being discriminated against based our, on our gender, it looks kind of wimpy. It's not something we're conditioned to do. In fact, it's something we're conditioned to accept. We register for the draft when we turn 18, and we're not supposed to be questioning the, the gender aspect of that. Um, we generally know that fathers don't get as good a deal in family court, and we don't really complain about it until it happens to us. And even then, a lot of men don't. Um, we've been conditioned to believe some of these gender roles are, are good. Um, we've con when we hear about gender discrimination, it's 99% of the time we only hear about women. So we're not educated about a lot of these things. For example, we never hear about how um, men were excluded from the Forced Labor Convention of 1930 for years. The, the, the Forced Labor Convention was an international treaty that, that banned slavery and forced servitude, but it made an exception for able-bodied males ages 18 to 45. And eventually they got rid of that, but there was still an exemption for prisoners and military, which is 90% male. So it, be, it went from explicit discrimination to implicit, just like often does, even with male victims. Um, we don't hear about that. We don't, we don't hear about sentencing disparities. The, the commissions on um, sex discrimination in the law, for instance, the, the commission on the elimination of bias in the law, doesn't talk about these things. I've never seen them do it. Um, those are some reasons. Um, other reasons are simply that we look up and we see most of the people in government positions and corporate heads are men. And historically there's been these laws and cultural norms that put men in charge and say your job, males, is to do, be, do this and to sort of put women were to be uh, pacified and, and subordinated, you know, or the marital laws, the old laws said that the woman was almost essentially the property of the man. So we hear about these things, and then when we hear about discrimination against men, we tend to go, we tend to laugh at it. What are you talking about? Men have controlled everything. And I think that's changing. Now what we're hearing from the feminist movement is different from what you'd hear from them 20 or 30 years ago. 20, 30 years ago, just like they would deny there are a lot of battered men and that they would deny that there's discrimination against men. Now you're hearing more, yes, there is, but it's men's fault. It's the fault of the patriarchy, and it has nothing to do with feminism. Um, my position on that, and, and the position of a lot of men's rights activists, I don't want to speak for all of them, but a lot of them, is that you have to, you have to look at this uh, in, in a larger perspective. Patriarchy is the result of gender roles, and not, not the vice versa. Gender roles put men and women in, in places. And they expect women to be like this and men to be like that. And so what we call patriarchy is men giving in to the expected roles that they're supposed to give in to. And many of those roles are very harmful, are very you know, um, time-consuming, very stressful, working exceptionally long hours, difficult hours, dangerous jobs, getting killed on the job. Um, even politics, a lot of people describe as, as masochism, very stressful on people. And so that's one thing we need to think about. But also, just because men are the ones, for instance, writing the laws in general, doesn't mean that the laws are protecting men. We can go all the way back to Sparta to learn that. It was mostly men in charge, but what would they do? If a boy was born without the exact right specifications, he would be killed. It was not something that was necessarily benefiting men. Men in power frequently discriminate against men. Male judges, I, I'm willing to believe they discriminate against father more than female judges. I haven't seen statistics on that, but um, I believe it. Um, so just because men are in power doesn't mean the discrimination is not there. And 
when, when, for instance, an African-American police officer racially profiles African-American males, that is still discrimination, and the black community gets angry about it just as much as if it was a white officer. Maybe not as angry, but they still get very angry about it. They challenge it. They point it out. Um, just because the discriminator happens to be black does not mean it's okay. There, I often ask people who, who, who make that argument, what about female genital mutilation? That is frequently encouraged by mothers in those cultures, but that doesn't mean it's not a woman's rights issue. It still is. If, if men are writing laws that discriminate against men, that is still a men's rights issue. I don't believe blaming women is the answer. I also don't believe um, denying feminists, re feminism's responsibility for it is the answer either. I think that um, when feminism says that they have no part in any of this, I think they're not being honest about it. I don't blame feminism for all of it, but I think they've had a role in it. They've written laws that discriminate against men. They fought to protect those, those laws, particularly in domestic violence areas. Every time I mean, they wrote that, that statute that I challenged, and for many, many years, second wave feminism would go through the statutes and change everything that was gender specific to something gender neutral, unless it was something that benefited women, like the domestic violence laws. They didn't change those. Um, other types of areas, like fathers in prison, there's statutes that specifically give mothers certain benefits that fathers in prison don't have. And I challenged that as well legally, but we didn't win on that one because we didn't have a, a, a father in prison. It was hard to find them, first of all, and we didn't have one who met the qualifications of those programs. You have to be um, the primary caretaker of your child and all that. Eventually, we'll find one, but it's hard. To, I, mean, I, I, I can't go into all the prisons and look for them. But um, every time men's rights groups try to pass joint custody, legislation, feminist groups fight them. They fought, this, they fought us on paternity fraud. In Sweden, they tried to create a man tax. Um, I mean, there's, in, in, in India, the men's rights movement is trying to get the rape laws to include male victims, and the feminist groups apparently are fighting that. I'm not saying all feminists are this way, but I think the ones who are affecting public policy, who have the lobbying power, I think they are. Uh, I know a number of feminists who aren't, who don't, who believe in men's rights, and I think it's increasing. But um, there's a lot, the, the, the lack of awareness out there about men's rights issues and the men's rights movement is, is amazing. The type of reactions you're getting today about the men's rights movement are the kind you would get 15 years ago when you talk about fathers' rights, and that has changed. If I mentioned father's rights 15 years ago when I was a law student, law student, people wouldn't like it. People would say, oh, you mean the ones who don't want to pay child support. Um, that has changed now. When you say father's rights, uh, you're going to have a divided room. You have some people who are very sympathetic to it, and you're not going to have uh, that immediate reaction of scorn. And I think the men's rights movement will evolve that way too. But it's going to take a much longer battle because it involves much more than just fathers. Um, and you're seeing the backlash a lot, like on the university campuses. There are people trying to form men's rights groups on the campus, and they get a lot of backlash. They get called names, just like what happened in, in Canada, I believe it was in Toronto, with A Voice for Men. Um, I don't always agree with the approach of, of, of all men's rights activists sometimes I think uh, you know, we don't all agree with each other's approach I, I have always taken a progressive approach to it I try and leave politics out because I work with people from both the right and the left and I've always fought to keep the National Coalition for Men um, politically neutral for example but it's hard because you have people from both camps in it and I th happen to think eventually as the movement grows, it might divide politically. You might start having groups that say, we are outspokenly um, left-leaning progressive men's rights activists, and we are outspokenly conservative. Um, it might happen. I've often thought that it might, because as, as it grows, I think that it might be inevitable. I don't know. But um, 
that's something that I just I think it needs to there needs to be more awareness and we do need to be cautious how we present ourselves we absolutely have to the, the, we are not about for instance probably the most controversial issue is rape and very frequently when we talk about false accusations we get immediately shot down as well we're downplaying the seriousness of rape or saying that just because a woman was drunk it was okay to rape her or that kind of thing which is not at all what we're saying we're, we're saying being drunk and having sex and then regretting it is not rape some college campuses are are expanding their definitions to such a point where it would include that. Um, universities are increasingly starting to kick men out on an accusation alone, like what we saw at Duke University. That's just one example. There are, we're reading of more and more of those where that kind of one-sided dialogue, where how, how dare you challenge and talk about false accusations, um, creates this atmosphere where when one is just accused, you're going to have mobs of people outside their homes, like the Duke players. Um, they're going to be kicked off the team. They're going to have a bunch of academic professors signing a declaration about the issue. They're going to be ostracized and, and um, vilified. And then once, once, if they're ever found innocent, then, well, you know, it kind of, that's, that was seen as just a minor exception. I think with rape we need a balanced dialogue. I know the statistics on false accusations are very controversial. They're more controversial than the domestic violence ones because they vary more. And that's simply because false accusations are very hard to measure. Unlike domestic violence where you can just, you can survey the population and get answers and then look for consistency in your different results, um, with false accusations, how do you measure it? How do you, you know, if you look at just the ones that are proven false, you're going to get, the FBI has, has said that's about 9%, and some people dispute that, but I've, re I've read the FBI report. It says about 9% coming from police agencies have been found to be false. But that's very conservative in my opinion, because I don't think the majority of them are found proven false. I think the majority just get buried with the others that were perhaps um, considered unsubstantiated but not proven false. Um, I do agree there's, there's probably a lot of rapes that don't get reported, but that doesn't mean there aren't a significant number of false accusations. The statistics range from that 9% figure, some people say less, but I would say the 9% is probably the lowest, to as high as 60% done by an Air Force study back in 1985 that's controversial in, in, its, in its methods, I think. Um, but whatever they are, a study in, 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 in India found it was 18%. Um, there are others that found around 30%. Whatever it is, even if it is 9 or 10 or 5, whatever it is, it needs to be talked about. It, you know, the Brian Banks story, if you've heard of that, is um, he, Brian Banks was a, a football player, a, a star football player in his high school, and he was about to be um, drafted to, to USC. I think it was USC that was going to take him. And then he was accused of rape. And as a result of that, he, he plea bargained. Um, he wound up spending about five years in jail until the accuser came out and admitted um, that it never happened. And there, in fact, was very little evidence except her accusation. Um, and since then, he's been released. And he was on 60 Minutes, and he's so things like that, or in the Duke case, will, will happen and will raise awareness. But um, there's still tremendous backlash on the campuses when you try to talk about it. And those are those are that's probably the most controversial issue in in men's rights advocacy, in my opinion. Um, domestic violence, you're starting, you're seeing more and more awareness about male victims and false accusations. You're seeing it's lightening up. Um, Fathers, custody rights, I think it's, it's all a very slow process, but we are seeing awareness. As late as the 1970s, bar associations were still telling, uh, advising judges to not give custody to men. Um, and I think one of the worst was Minnesota. There's a Time Magazine article about that. Um, not, it, it was just advice, but it still, it was, shows the mentality at that time. Um, that's, that's changing. I mean, we're, 
we're seeing that change, but I still think that there is a bias there. And this, this kind of bias gets, is hard to put, put your finger on because it's buried in a number of other factors. That men work more, more hours outside the home, so it's harder to be a primary caretaker. They might not have been the primary caretaker throughout the marriage, so, or throughout the relationship or the child's life. So, you know, the courts use that as the reason to, to give them less time. And that's a debatable issue, but I think sometimes the gender bias gets buried in that. And I've seen it, what I believe to be quite obvious examples of it. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. I, every oh, time you okay. ask a question, I just ramble. Oh, it's okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you can agree. This is all fascinating.